Today in the workshop, we're building a robot car using mechanum wheels. You'll see how mechanum wheels work and how we can write code to manipulate them. We'll also use a cool ESP32 module to build a remote control with a joystick and a TFT display. We're moving in every direction today, so welcome to the workshop. Well, hello and welcome to the workshop, or I should say welcome back to the workshop. It's been a while since we've had a video, but I'm hoping that today's video will more than make up for that gap in material. Now, today we're going to be building a small robot car, and as you've already surmised from the introduction and the title of the video, the car uses some very special wheels, wheels called mechanum wheels. And if you're not familiar with mechanum wheels, I think you'll find them pretty fascinating. Not only can they move backwards and forwards, like normal wheels, but they can also move sideways and at a bunch of different angles. But aside from fancy wheels, I think this project is really cool because it incorporates a lot of the technologies that we've already looked at here in the DroneBot workshop, plus a couple of new ones that we haven't seen yet. Our car is based around an ESP32, and of course we've built several ESP32 projects. It also uses a number of NeoPixel LEDs, addressable RGB LEDs, and we've We've talked extensively about those before as well. The car has a separate controller, unlike other ESP32 designs where you'd use a phone or a tablet to control it, we've got a separate physical controller with a joystick and a really neat ESP32 module that includes an integrated TFT display plus provisions for connecting a small LiPo battery that can be charged from the module, and so it makes for a great remote control. Now the remote control and the car are going to communicate with one another using ESP Now protocol. So they're going to set up a peer-to-peer -peer network between them. You won't need an external router or anything. They can just talk to one another and they can send data back and forth. And so we're going to use the TFT display on our remote to display data that comes from the robot car. So there's a lot of interesting technologies at work today. But of course, one of the more interesting ones is the wheels that we're using. So let's go and learn a little bit about mechanum wheels. A mechanum wheel is an omnidirectional wheel that can propel a vehicle in any direction. The mechanum wheel was invented and patented in 1972 by Banked Erland Island. It was named after Mechanum AB, the Swedish design firm that Mr. Island worked for. The mechanum wheel is sometimes called a Swedish wheel or an island wheel. Mr. Island sold the patent to the U.S. Navy in 1980. In 1997, the U.S. Navy released the rights to the mechanum wheel, so you can use them in your design without worrying about violating any U.S. Navy copyrights. The mechanum wheel should not be confused with the omni wheel. The omni wheel is indeed an omnidirectional wheel, but it can only propel a vehicle in a forward direction. It cannot propel it sideways. The rollers on a mechanum wheel are tapered to provide a smoother ride and a single point of contact. There are also two styles of mechanum wheel that are used on the same vehicle. One of these has the rollers at a 45 degree angle toward the axle line, whereas the other one has them at a 45 degree angle as compared to the plane of the wheel. These wheels are arranged in a vehicle as shown here. By moving all of the wheels in the same direction, the vehicle will be propelled in a straight line. Moving the wheels in the direction shown here will propel the vehicle sideways. Reversing the direction of rotation on all the motors will send the vehicle toward the other side. By only using two of the wheels, you can have the vehicle move diagonally. You can change the wheels to change the angle, and you can change the direction of rotation as well. Rotating two wheels on one side will cause the vehicle to pivot. If you drive two wheels on one side of the vehicle in the same direction and the other two wheels in the opposite direction, the vehicle will rotate. And by driving the front two wheels in opposite directions, you can make a pivot sideways. Mechanum wheels have found many unique applications. Industrial forklifts and lifting platforms, robotics of course, and mechanum wheel wheelchairs which can offer the user a great deal of flexibility of movement. 
Today we're going to use a simple mechanum wheel robotics platform for our experiments. There are many of these available on eBay and Amazon to choose from and they're not that expensive. You can also buy the wheels individually and just adapt one of your own four wheel robotics platforms to it. So now let's take a look at the platform that I'm using to experiment with the mechanum wheels. Now here are the contents of the Mechanum Wheel Robot Car Kit that I purchased from one of my local distributors and I was actually kind of surprised, pleasantly surprised, to see that this seems to use aluminum instead of the acrylic that we normally see. Otherwise we got four of the standard yellow motors I'm sure that we're all uh, familiar with and we've got a bag full of hardware which I suppose can put everything together here there were no instructions whatsoever these appear to be hubcaps that would fit onto the mechanum wheels and then we have the four mechanum wheels themselves and as we went over there are actually two different types of wheel if I bring them up over here you can sort of see that one wheel has the rollers going in one direction and the other one in the opposite direction and there are two of each of those and so I'm going to throw this kit together and we can start experimenting with our mechanum wheels. So now that we know the theory behind mechanum wheels and that we've taken a look at the wheels that I'm going to be using in my project, it's time to get working with them. So what we're going to do is mount four of the motors and four of the wheels onto the chassis. I'm going to put it up on blocks, so to speak, so it doesn't run around on my workbench. And then we'll see what it takes to code for these wheels and make them move in the correct directions. And so here's how I've rigged up my mechanum wheels so we can give it some basic tests before we actually build the complete robot. And you'll notice I've got the four wheels mounted onto the base. Now before you start making comments about it in the comments, you'll notice I still have the blue plastic on over here. And that's intentional because I actually still have some work to do on this base. I need to drill some more holes in it so I can mount the circuit board for our final robot car design. And it's better to keep the plastic on while you're doing the drilling so you don't scratch up the aluminum and so the motors are just temporarily mounted over here but you'll notice that I've got the mechanum wheels angled up correctly so that uh, these two motors are basically using the same wheel and these two motors here are using the same style of mechanum wheel and that of course refers to the angle that the rollers are on the wheel. Now I'm powering everything up with an ESP32 and I'll show you the hookup for that in a moment. I've uh, done something over here that I suggest that you do and that is is just to map out the connections to all of your wheels so you know which is positive and which is negative and when I say positive I'm referring to the fact that if I hook the motor up this way the car goes forward and as for forward I drew on the blue plastic an arrow over here to indicate what forward is because of course with this car base it's kind of hard to determine what is forward there really is no front or back on this style of design but uh, this is what we're going to be using to do a few tests on the mechanics Canum wheels before we act to go and build our robot car. So now let me show you how I hooked up the ESP32 and the motor drivers. Now here's how we're going to hook up our Mechum wheel test bed. We're going to be basing everything around an ESP32 and for my experiments today I'm using an ESP32 dev kit C module. You could use a different ESP32 module providing that it had the same pinouts. Now we need a couple of dual motor drivers because we have four motors and I'm using the TB6612FNG which is pretty well my favorite H-Bridge module. You could also use an L298N if you wanted to and you can see my previous videos and articles about motor drivers to let you know how to wire that up instead. I've got the motor drivers divided as a front and a rear one and of course they're going to be driving the four motors, my right front, left front, right rear and left rear motor. We also of course need a power supply for our motors and I'm just using a 6 volt battery pack which works pretty well with the kind of motors I have on my test bed. If you're using different motors you'll of course need a different voltage power supply. Just remember not to exceed the ratings on the TB6612FNG. Now we'll begin by connecting the positive side of the motor power to the VM pin on both of the motor drivers. We'll connect the negative side of the motor power to one of the ground pins on each of the H bridges. The 3.3 volt output on the ESP32 is connected to the VCC on both of the H bridges. 
We'll also connect one of the grounds from the ESP32 to one of the grounds on each of the H bridges. The 3.3 volts from the ESP32 is also run to the standby pins on each of the driver modules. You need to bring these pins high in order to take the modules out of standby mode. Now we'll wire up all the input pins on the H-Bridge modules to the ESP32 I.O. pins. We're going to start with the front module and we'll wire its PWMA pin to the ESP32's GPIO 19. We'll run AI2 to GPIO 23, AI1 to GPIO 32, BI1 to GPIO 33, BI2 to GP25, and the PWMB pin will run to GPIO pin 26. Now we'll do the other module where the PWMA pin goes to GPIO pin 27 on the ESP32. The AI2 input goes to GPIO 14. AI1 to GPIO 12, BI1 to GPIO 13, BI2 to GPIO 2, and PWMB is run all the way to the GPIO 4 pin. The last thing we need to do is connect up our motors. We'll connect the right front motor to the motor driver's A01 and A02 outputs. The left front motor will be connected to the modules B01 and B02 outputs. Note the positioning of those outputs on the module and how they're essentially a mirror image of each other. We'll do the same thing for the rear motor. So the right rear motor will go to the A01 and A02 outputs on the second H-bridge, and the left rear motor will go to B01 and B02. And that completes the wiring. Now let's go and take a look at a sketch we can use to move our motors around. Now the first sketch that we're going to run on our Mechanum wheel base is a very simple sketch, but it will test the operation of all four of the motors. And this will let you know that you've got all of the motors hooked up correctly, that you've got the polarities of the motors correct, that you've got all the inputs to the motor drivers correct. So it's a good thing to run for test purposes. Now we're going to start off by defining all the connections we have to the four different motor drivers. And so that's these over here. And then we define a couple of preset speeds, and you can change these if you want to. We're going to call the slow speed a value of 100 and the fast speed a value of 250. And you can go from anything from 0 to 255. Although if you go below 100, you'll find that a lot of motors will be very, very sluggish. So you can modify those if you need to. In setup, all we do is we basically set up all those pins that we defined earlier as being outputs. And then we go into the loop, and the loop is very basic. We're just going to go motor by motor and run it at a slow speed and a fast speed forward. And then we're going to stop and then reverse it fast and slow and stop again. And so we do a number of digital writes and analog writes. We're doing digital write to the two input pins to set the direction. And we do an analog write to set the speed. We start off with the slow speed and then we go to the fast speed. And we put a delay in over here. Now I should make note that analog write is not the only method of doing pulse width modulation on an ESP32 and in fact it's not the best method for doing it and in the sketches that we're going to be proceeding into after this we're going to be replacing analog right with something else but I just wanted to use it right now because it's a very basic sketch and most people are familiar with the operation of analog right as you can use it in the Arduino as well and so anyway we just cycle things through we set it up for forward we do it analog right then we change the speed fast it's still going forward so we don't have to manipulate these bits we'll do that for two seconds we'll stop for a second by selecting the speed to zero and then we'll reverse it by doing the digital writes over here do our analog right at a fast speed for two seconds and then we'll reverse to a slow speed for two seconds and then we'll stop for a second and we go and do that for the left motor then the right rear motor and the right and the rear left motor and so basically we go through all four motors cycle them back and forth so it's a pretty basic sketch but again it's very good for testing purposes so let's load it up and take a look at it in action 
And so I'm ready to begin testing all of our motors up. Now, one thing I wanted to mention before I got going is that one thing that I found handy when I was developing this was a logic probe. And the reason I found it handy is I actually did have a wiring issue that I was able to troubleshoot quite quickly with something like this, probably even quicker than I could have used an oscilloscope. And I just wanted to mention that this is a very handy thing to have around. It'll let you know whether the level is a zero or a one or whether it's pulsing. And they're very inexpensive expensive, so they're certainly a lot cheaper than a scope. So if you want to move your test equipment game up beyond a multimeter, I would suggest that be your next purchase. At any rate, uh, logic probes aside, we're ready to begin. Now you can see I'm using uh, some six volt battery pack over here to power everything up and everything's all hooked up. All I have to do is actually connect the USB cable. So excuse me while I do that. And there we go. And it's cycling through all the motions with each of the wheels. And they all seem to work, although the 100 value for PWM is actually very, very picky on this wheel over here. And as we're going to see in a bit, there's an issue with these motors that we're going to try to resolve. But otherwise, we can see that they're hooked up correctly. And so we can move on to actually making the mechanum wheels move in the various directions that they're capable of. Earlier on, we saw that there were different modes that you could run the mechanum wheels in. These modes depended upon which wheels you had activated and what direction they were spinning in. Now, we of course have four motors, one attached to each one of the wheels, and we can represent them as the motor front and the motor rear motors, both left and right. The motor drivers driving these motors have two channels, an A and a B channel, and it has two inputs, an I1 and an I2 for each channel. These two inputs determine the direction that the motor will rotate, and we can see the truth table for that below. Now as we have four motors and two inputs per motor, that means eight bits would describe every movement that we need to make, and eight bits of course is a byte. And so let's take a look at the straight mode. Now you can see from the truth table below that we have the eight bits that we'd have to activate to go straight. And there are two different modes here because we can go forward or backwards. In a similar fashion, this is a sideways mode. And there are two modes here again, to go sideways to the right or sideways to the left. There are four diagonal modes because there are four different directions we can go in. Now I should point out right now that this does not mean that our car is restricted to only going 45, 135, 225, and 315 degrees. You can go any angle you want by varying the ratio of the speed between the wheels. However, at this point we're only concerned with direction. There are also four different methods of pivoting, depending on whether you pivot on the right or pivot on the left. We can define two different rotations, a clockwise and a counterclockwise rotation. And there are four sideways pivots as well, pivots from the front and pivots from the rear. We can combine all of our data into this table, which will show you that with 18 bytes, we can represent every different mode that our mechanum wheels can use. So let's go and see how we would code something using these 18 bytes. Now here's the sketch that we're going to use to put the mechanum wheels through their paces. And it's a fairly simple sketch, but it has something different as far as the PWM goes. And so we'll take a look at that in a moment. Now we're going to start off the same as we did before by defining the connections to the two motor controller modules. And so that's the connections over here. We've also got some variables for the speed, which are in this sketch, but in actual fact, we're only keeping one speed for this demonstration. But this is actually for future purposes. 
purposes because as we develop sketches we'll be making more use of these variables. Now here's where we define the individual bytes, the 18 different bytes that represent the different mechanum wheel modes. And so each one of these is a byte constant and it's got a name to it and then a byte value and this B over here tells us that we can use binary numbers over here to represent the byte. And when you highlight it over here with the IDE 2.0 it also shows you the decimal number so for this first one for example it's got a value of 170. Okay here's a variable just for a time delay that we're using within our test and now some parameters for our motor control and this is a bit different than what we used before. Now we want the frequency that we're going to use the PWM at and I'm using a kilohertz the resolution of 8 bits and we're defining a PWM channel for each motor. Now what's that all about? Well let me explain. On the ESP32 there are actually some dedicated registers for performing PWM operations. There are two dedicated registers for doing it for motors and 16 for doing it for LEDs. Now just because it's called an LED register doesn't mean it's restricted to LED use. It can be used for a number of different purposes for PWM including motors and as there are only two motor channels on the ESP32 we're going to be using the LED ones instead. So these are the four different channels that I've defined. Now you could define any four you want. Uh, they go from 0 to 15. And here is a function to move all of our motors. And so we have five inputs to the function, the speed of the individual motors, and the byte that represents the direction control. Now, for each of the motors, we do the same thing. For the right front motor, for example, we write to the two different bits, the I1 and the I2 inputs, and we use bits 7 and 6 from our direction control byte. The bit read function lets you get the individual bits from the byte. And this is how we are writing to our motors. We're going to do an LEDC write, and that is the pulse mod with modulation LED function. We're going to write it to a specific PWM channel, and we're going to write the speed to it. And we do that for all four of the motors. Now here's another function to stop the motors, and to stop the motors, again, we just write zeros to all of those channels, and then we set all the bits to zero for the inputs for the motor control modules. Now in the setup, you can see the rest of the uh, LED uh, parameters. And we start off with the serial begins because we want to use our serial monitor pin mode as we did before just to set everything as an output. Now here we come to the PWM for the LEDs. Now first of all we do an LEDC setup and this sets up each one of the channels so we match a channel and its frequency and its resolution. And then we attach those channels to the pins that we had. So we attach it to the pin, in this case the PWMA pin, is going to this particular channel. So we've attached all four channels to our pins, and that's how that works. And here we're setting the test speed. There it's set all the 200. But you can vary this a bit to see what happens when you change the motors and make different speeds. And now the loop, we're just going to go through a bunch of the functions. We start with a three second delay, and then we print out to the serial monitor to let us know what function we're into. And then we do call move motors. We pass the four speed parameters, and then we call the uh, control byte, which in this particular case is mech straight forward. And uh, we call that up. We do a time delay to run it for a specific time. Right now, time delay is set to 2000, so it'll run for two seconds. We stop the motors and delay for half a second second. And then we go through the other operations and we step through a number of them. Now I'm only doing eight of them, just the ones that move forward, backward, sideways, and at an angle. But you can add the other ones in if you wish just to see how your motors move. So that's the sketch we're going to use. Let's load it up and take a look at it in action. And so we're going to put the car through the paces. We've got the Mechanum wheel demo sketch running. And as you can see, the wheels seem to be going through the correct motions. You can watch the serial monitor to see what phase we are in. And that should be the end of the cycle. It'll wait three seconds and go over it again. So that does indeed demonstrate that our code works. But what we really want to do, of course, is see how the vehicle moves using the mechanum wheels in these different modes. And for that, we're going to have to put it down on the ground. So let's see if we can do that now. 
So in order to put the car down on the floor and still keep my circuitry on the solderless breadboard, I decided to extend the motor wires. And the easiest way that I could think of doing that was to use an Ethernet cable because it has the eight conductors that I required and is quite flexible. In order to make the connection simple, I used the SparkFun RJ45 breakout box on each end. Now, as you can see, the car is going through the motions, and I have to admit, when I first started seeing it go sideways, it was pretty impressive. Now, it isn't perfect. With the code I wrote, the car should end up back in the same point it started from, and it clearly doesn't. However, this discrepancy is because of a number of things, the surface that I'm driving on, and also speed differences between all four of the motors. Unfortunately, I can't do much about either. The surface is what it is, and as for the speed differences, I I don't have a speed sensor on the high speed side of the motors. The best I could do is to be putting one on the low speed side, and that isn't a good way of regulating speed. Nonetheless, I think it's a good design, and so we'll continue building our Mechanum robot car. Now before we start building our car, I want to address another aspect of its design, and that's the NeoPixel displays that I'm using. I'm using five individual NeoPixel LEDs. Four of these LEDs are going to be used to indicate the direction that each of the motors is traveling in, and the fifth one is a status LED. Now NeoPixels have a number of different advantages over regular RGB LEDs, and I did an entire video about RGB LEDs that included NeoPixels, so you might want to take a look at that. But essentially these are addressable LEDs and they are daisy chained. So instead of needing a whole bunch of I.O. ports, I would normally need 15 I.O. ports to drive five RGB LEDs, NeoPixels can be driven with just one I.O. port, so it really is a saving there. However, there are timing considerations with NeoPixels, and as you're going to see, also considerations about using specific NeoPixels pixel libraries. So let's go and take a look at our colorful NeoPixels. We're going to be making use of five Adafruit 8mm NeoPixel displays, and they conveniently come in packages of five. Adafruit also makes 5mm versions of them as well. Now these LEDs may look like regular RGB LEDs, but they aren't. They're addressable and the pinouts are quite different. You can identify the pinouts by looking for the flat side on the LED, and if the LED is brand new, you can also look at the length of the leads. Going from left to right, the first pin is the data input pin. This is a 5 volt data input for driving the LED. The next pin is the 5 volt power supply, and the pin beside that, the longest lead, is the ground lead. The final pin is the data out pin. NeoPixels are daisy chained, so you'll connect the data out from one NeoPixel to the data in on the next one. We're going to keep the same wiring that we have for our motors, so don't get rid of that. I'm just going to get rid of it from our diagram to make it a bit easier to see things. Now to our circuit, we're going to be adding five 8mm NeoPixel LEDs. This will be the status LED, the right front, left front, right rear, and left rear LEDs. I'm also using a two-channel logic level converter to convert the 3.3 volt logic of the ESP32 to the 5 volt logic required by the LEDs. You could also use a bipolar transistor to do this as well. We'll require a 330 ohm resistor, and we'll need 5.1 microfarad capacitors, and physically you want these capacitors to be quite close to the individual LEDs. We'll begin by connecting the 5 volt output of the ESP32 to the 5 volt pin on all of our NeoPixels. We'll also connect the 5 volts to the 5V connection on the logic level converter. The ESP32's ground will go to the ground side of all of the NeoPixels. We'll also send the ground to the two ground leads on the logic level converter. In actual fact, you only need to connect one of them up as they're internally tied together. We'll connect the 3.3 volt output of the ESP32 to the 3.3 volt input on our logic level converter. And we'll connect all of our 0.1 microfarad capacitors across the power supply for each of the LEDs. We'll then connect GPIO pin 5 of the ESP32 to the logic level converter's 3A input. We'll connect the level converter's 5A output through a 330 ohm resistor to the input on the status LED. This will be our first LED. 
will connect the output of the status LED to the input of the right front LED, and will continue to daisy chain the rest of the LEDs. There's no final connection to the left rear LED, of course, because that's the end of our daisy chain. And this completes our wiring. Now here's the sketch that we're going to use just to check out our NeoPixel connection. And this is just an adaptation of the sketch that we used earlier to check out all the mechanum movements of the motor. And so I've just added the NeoPixel components to that same sketch. So the first thing that I added was to include the Adafruit NeoPixel library. Now if you don't have that, of course, you can install that through your library manager. And this library has a number of dependent libraries. And if you don't have those, the library manager will offer to install those as well and you should take it up on that offer because you're going to need those. After that we go through the same things we've seen before with the motor connections and the motor speed and defining the constants we use for the motor movement and uh, motor control. So we won't go through that. We'll get down to our first NeoPixel related thing which is this one over here. We're going to define the pin that we've connected our NeoPixels to. In our case it is pin number five and we need to know the number of NeoPixels that we have, and we have four of them. Now you can address the NeoPixels with their actual address, which in our case would be 0, 1, 2, and 3. However, I find it a lot easier to read the code if I give them names. So I just define names for all of our NeoPixels. So here we are at the right front, left front, right rear, and left rear NeoPixel. And in a similar fashion, I want to use four different colors in this demonstration, and you could just input the RGB values. They could also be inputted as hexadecimal values. But again, I find it easier to read when we just define constants. So here's red, green, blue, and yellow. And of course, if you wish, you could change it to different colors. You don't have to use the ones that I used. Now, this is the part where we create an object called pixels with the NeoPixel library. So we're going to create this pixels objects and the parameters we need, first of all, are the number of pixels, which in our case is four, the port that we're going to in our case is five. We need the mode that we're going to run the NeoPixels in, and this is a very important parameter. Different styles of NeoPixels can run in different modes. Some of them, for example, also have a white component to them. Ours are NeoRGB, and that's the only kind that you can use with the discrete NeoPixel, so it's a very important parameter. And this is the frequency that we're going to be addressing the NeoPixels at, 800 kilo hurts. Now, this is the function for moving the motors that we've seen before, the stopping the motors. Now we're down to another NeoPixel function, and this is the LED motor status. So this is what's going to give you the status for all four motors when they're moving. And we're going to input the same control byte that we used earlier. So the bytes we defined are going to be inputted into here, and that will determine which NeoPixels we're going to light and what color we're going to light them in. So first of all, we're going to check the right front which if you recall is bits number seven and six. So we go through to three different cases. First of all, with the first bit being high and the second bit being low, that means we're moving that particular motor forward and we want to use blue to indicate forward. So we do a set pixel color and we define which pixel we're doing, the right front pixels, and then we're going to do pixels color and then the LED blue is the color we've defined, 00255 over here. If we're going in reverse, then it's the opposite thing. The high bit will be a zero and the second bit will be a one. And so we're going to move in reverse and we do the same thing, except this time we set it yellow to indicate we're going in reverse. Any other condition, which would be either a zero, zero or a one, one, which is actually a braking condition, although we're not using that, but they both indicate that the motor would have been stopped. So in that case, we're going to set our NeoPixels red. Now, one important thing to note is that we're going to go through this and do this for all the different motors, but this doesn't actually set the color at this point. At the very end, you need to do pixels.show. So after you set the colors, nothing will change until you do pixels.show. NeoPixels retain their previous state until they are refreshed with this. Okay, a couple of other NeoPixel functions written over here. We've got the LED turn off, and this just turns off all of the NeoPixels. So we do a pixels clear, and again, we have to do pixels.show, or else this will be ineffective. 
Then we do an LED all stop is the other one that I created. And this just turns all of the Neo pixels red. And we would do this in the case where we're just stopping all the motors. If we don't do that, the Neo pixels will just retain the last state that they had. So we're going to clear all of our pixels, set them all to red, and then we'll do a pixel shell. Now in setup, there's only one thing that we need to do for the NeoPixels, and we need to initiate them. So we do pixels.begin here, and then we'll go through the loop. And the loop is basically the same as what we saw before with the Mechum test, with the addition of some NeoPixel things. So at the very beginning, we're going to stop all the motors. We're going to put the LED all stop function on, so that'll turn all the lights red. Delay for about three seconds. And then we're going to go forward. We do the same thing we did before with moving the motors forward. And we pass it the mech straight forward constant. We also now will do LED motor status and pass it the mech straight forward. And that will light up the LED in this particular case blue because we're going forward. We'll run for the time delay, which I believe I defined as being a second. And then we'll stop the motors and do LED all stop, which will turn all of them red and delay for half a second. And we go through all the various iterations and do exactly the same thing. And so this is basically just an addition to the previous sketch with the NeoPixels. Let's load it up and take a quick look at it running. All right, I've got everything hooked up and ready to test. As you can see, I've mounted my LEDs onto a second solderless breadboard along with the logic level converter. And the car, of course, is still up on blocks and it's still connected with the ethernet cable because I've been doing tests on the floor as well. So all I need to do is plug the USB in to get this thing going. We start off all red and blue for forward, green for reverse and then we exchange colors to indicate the direction of the motor. Now, of course, in the final design, I intend to mount the LEDs very close to the motor that they're driving, so that at a glance you can see which direction the motor is spinning in, and learn a little bit more about mechanum wheels. Well, after putting everything together with my NeoPixels and my motors and my ESP now that I'm going to be using for communications, I found out that I had an issue. There is a conflict between the ESP now library and between the Adafruit NeoPixel library. And while there are ways of resolving that conflict, I resolved it in the simplest method possible. I used a different NeoPixel library. I chose the NeoPixel bus library by Michael C. Miller, and I'm going to be using that in the final design of the robot. So I just wanted to let you know that although we've done our demonstration with the Adafruit library, it's not the one that we're going to use in the final design. So now that we've seen how all the various components in our robot work, it's time to actually put it together. Now, I showed you the chassis that I'm using earlier in the video, and you may indeed be using the same chassis, but you're probably using a different one. So I'm not going to dwell too much on the hardware assembly, but I will show you how my final build looks. Electrically, we have already seen the circuit. We've seen how to hook up the motors and we've seen how to hook up the LEDs. All that's missing is a power supply. And we're going to need to have power for both the motors and for the ESP32 slash LEDs. And so we'll cover that in a few moments. Now, as for building the circuit permanently, I used perf board. I used a perf board for most of the circuitry and little tiny pieces of perf board to hold the LEDs. And that's a good construction technique you could use it on a solderless breadboard, but solderless breadboards are a little bit fragile for something like a robot that gets bumped around a lot. One nice compromise is to use one of those circuit boards that emulate a solderless breadboard and to solder your components onto that. So there's a number of different ways you could do that as well. So let's go and take a look at my robot build. And so here's the robot car assembled, except it doesn't have its circuit board mounted on it. And I just wanted to show it to you before I put the board onto it and also show you the circuit board. Now uh, we'll start by flipping it over to the bottom and we'll take a look at the motor assembly. I just wanted to show you that I've added a few capacitors over here. And these are across the motors just to try to reduce some of the EMF from the uh, motors when they're running. Now if we go on to the middle section of this car because it's got two layers, the middle section seems pretty sparsely populated but there's a reason for that. I've got these, I've got these little sensors and these are 
are the speed sensors that you can use for these motors along with the discs and they mount over here now I haven't used them in this design yet but I'm preparing to use them in an update to the design so I wanted to leave space for those uh, another thing that's mounted on the main layer over here on the bottom layer are all these little LEDs and these are the NeoPixels the 8 millimeter NeoPixels and on each one of them it's a little hard to see but there's a little capacitor across the power leads and that's kind of a requirement for the NeoPixels. There's also a NeoPixel mounted here in the top along with a power switch and the power switch runs down to a voltage regulator and if you look inside there it's a little hard to see you'll see the voltage regulator. Now that's a buck converter that I'm using and I toyed between using a buck converter and a low dropout um, analog voltage regulator. I was concerned the buck converter might have a bit too much noise on the line for the ESP32 but it seems to be fine. I can always replace it but it's mounted under there and so it uh, provides the 5 volt supply and the two batteries the uh, 18650s will mount in holders over here on each end. Now if we look at the top we can see a lot of the wiring. These are all the LED wires, the wires that came from the LEDs and uh, over here we've also got a number of wires. These are wires that came from the motors and they're going to go to the circuit board which is going to mount over here. I've left this end over here free and there's enough space to add another circuit board or even a single board computer so again this design can be updated. Now uh, let's just take a look at the circuit card itself. Now here's the card that I wired for it and uh, it's just done on perf board. Uh, it's uh, not a difficult wiring job. We've got of course the ESP32 and the two motor driver chips and they're all in uh, female sockets so they can be removed and replaced. This is the logic level converter over here and these are the connections that go to the LEDs and the daisy chaining is already done on the board over here and I've got them color coded so I know which way they go. This is the input for the power, and so I've got the um, the high voltage, the battery voltage, the ground, and the 5 volts over here. This connector is just a ground connector, and I've got a few ground wires mounted over here on the robot that go over to there so that we can also ground the chassis to perhaps reduce a bit of electrical noise. And the only thing that you'll notice on here that you didn't see in the original circuit is a number of capacitors, and these are just filter capacitors. I've got them across the motor voltage line on each of the motor drivers. Another one across the motor voltage here <clears throat> and these two or across the 5 volt line and I wired this up uh, just by hand It's quite a simple wiring job really it only took maybe about two hours and you'll note I used different uh, uh, gauges of wire. I used a heavier gauge for the power and ground as well as for the motor connections and then I used a 30 gauge wire to do all the logic connections and so that went together pretty easy. So all I need to do is now mount this board onto here and I'll have completed the construction of the robot car. Now here's a schematic of the power supply that I used for my robot and as you can see it's a pretty simple power supply. I used two 18650 batteries in series and that provides enough power for my motors. I also feed that into an LM2596 buck converter that I've preset for a 5 volt output. And I feed that 5 volt output to the 5 volt pin on the ESP32. Now you could use the same power supply I used. You could make a few variations on it such as using a linear voltage regulator instead of the LM2596. However, you'd have to use a low dropout linear voltage regulator because a regular one like a 7805 is going to drop out too soon and you won't get a lot of battery life. A simpler power supply might be just to use four AA cells to power your motors and then use a 5 volt USB adapter to power the ESP32. So there are many options you have for powering up your robot. So now that we have the car constructed, we have to turn our attention to the remote control. And our remote control is based upon a really neat ESP32 module that's made by a company called LilyGo, and it's called the TTGo T-Display. This module has an integrated TFT display, as well as provisions for charging a LiPo battery, and we're going to be using both of those features in our design. Now this is a great module, and you can get it at Amazon, you can also get it at Ali 
Alibaba. They have a number of really great modules at LilyGo. However, one thing they don't seem to have is a lot of great documentation. The documentation is very sparse for these modules. However, there is an excellent source of documentation for this particular module, for the TTGo module, and I want to point that out to you. It is another YouTube channel called Volos Projects, and he has done some amazing things with this module. He's created little games, little calculators, all sorts of designs, and his style of explaining how the code works is absolutely excellent, so you can learn a lot about this module by watching the videos on his channel, and I'll leave a link to his channel in the description of this video. So let's grab our TTGo display and start building our remote control. In its native form, our joystick is going to be reading numbers from 0 to 255 on each of the potentiometers. However, to make things easier, we're going to convert that range from a range of negative 255 to positive 255 for both the X and Y axis potentiometer. This will make our coding a lot easier. So in this scenario, when the joystick is in the center position, both X and Y will be equal to 0 and all motors will be stopped. If we push the joystick forward, our Y value will have a positive value, whereas the X value will remain at zero, and this is the mech straight forward operation we'll be using. Pulling it backwards will cause the opposite effect. X will still be zero and Y will be a negative value, and this will be the mech straight backwards. If we push our joystick to the right, the X value will become positive while the Y value will become a zero, and this will be the sideways right operation. Sideways left is the opposite in which the X value is negative and the Y value will remain at zero. If we push our joystick up diagonally at a 45 degree angle, both X and Y will be positive. The mech diagonal 45 will be used. Note that we can get angles other than 45 degrees by changing the ratio of the speed between the X and the Y motor. In a similar fashion, if we push it off to the other side, X will be negative and Y will be positive, and this is the mech diagonal 135 constant. Pulling it down to the left will cause both X and Y to be negative and will invoke the mech diagonal 225 constant. And finally, pulling it down to the right will cause a positive value for X, a negative value for Y, and we'll call the mech diagonal 315 constant. Now here's a chart that summarizes all of the various joystick conditions and the constant that we'll need to call within our code. We can use this chart when we're developing our code. Now this is the TTGo module that we're going to be using for our controller and it comes in this nice little plastic case and I'm going to actually use the plastic case as the case for my controller. Uh, the module comes unsoldered so they give you all the DuPont pins that you need to solder onto it. It also comes with a connector wire for the battery and that's a good thing because this very tiny JST connector that they have is a bit hard to find and so you can use that to connect to the onboard battery. Now they pack a lot of different things into this module over here. You can see the display takes over most of the surface here. There's also a couple of push buttons and these are connected to two of the GPIO pins and you can use those just as part of your circuit. This is the USB-C connector of course for both power and data. This is a reset button on the side over here and it's a very convenient place for it. Now if you flip this over you'll see there's components on the back over here as well. This is the connector for the battery and down over here it's uh, difficult to see but one of these components here is an LED and that's the built-in LED so when you have this on a solderless breadboard it's a bit difficult because for one thing this battery connector prevents you from going to insert the thing all the way down on the breadboard so you'll have to put this module at the very edge of your solderless breadboard and the built-in LED will then be facing down so they did pack a lot of things onto this and I'll give them credit for that. Now, it comes already with demo software on it, so let's just hook it up right now and take a look, and it says TTGo. And we get a couple of colors. 
and then we get a menu. I'm going to pull the plastic protector off so we can see that a little better. And as you can see, the uh, left button does a Wi-Fi scan, so we'll do that and we'll scan our Wi-Fi networks. And here's all the local Wi-Fi networks it can pick up. The other button is a voltage measurement, and so that measures the voltage. Now, right now, of course, that's the voltage from my USB-C, but you can measure the battery voltage as well. And you can use those sketches as examples, of course, for your own sketches. But it's a really neat little compact module. It's very well priced. I picked mine up on Amazon. They also have them at Alibaba. And it's going to be great for building our remote control. Our remote control is going to be constructed around the LilyGo TTGo T display. This is a small ESP32 module with a lot of features to it. It has a 1.14 inch IPS display. At the bottom we can see that it has a USB-C connection for both power and data. There's a very convenient reset button on it. And there are two push buttons internally connected to two of the GPIO pins on the ESP32, GPIO0 and GPIO35. If we flip the board over, we'll see that there's a battery connector on the bottom for a LiPo battery. The charging is also built into the board. The board also has a built-in LED that's in the corner of the board on the bottom. The LilyGo TTGo T display is based around an ESP32 240 MHz 32 bit MCU. There are two versions, one with a single core and one with a dual core. The two versions have either 4 MB or 16 MB of flash RAM. Both versions have 520 KB of static RAM. It has, of course, Wi Fi and Bluetooth capability. And its most prominent feature is an ST7789V IPS display, which is internally connected using the SPI bus. The battery charge current is 500 milliamps, which is rather high for some small cells. You'll need to use a battery that has a capability of at least 800 milliamps in order to use this device. Our hookup is very simple. In addition to the TTGo module, we'll require a standard analog joystick. The ground of the joystick will be connected to the ground of the TTGo module. The joystick's VCC will be connected to the 3.3 volt output of the TTGo. Note that on many joysticks this is labeled 5 volts, but as these are just resistive elements, they'll really work at any voltage. The joystick's x-axis output will be connected to GPIO pin 32, and the joystick's y output will be connected to GPIO 33. Note that on some joysticks, the X and Y axis have been reversed, so it might be possible that you'll need to reverse these two connections. You can also do that just in the code. And finally, the joystick switch output will be connected to GPIO pin 27. And this completes the wiring of our remote control. And here's the controller that we're going to be building. As you'll notice, I've got mine mounted in the plastic case that the TTGo module came in. I just cut the lid off the plastic case and found it to be a convenient way of doing it. I've just wired it up on perf board. Of course, the wiring is very, very simple for this. It's just simply connecting a joystick up to a couple of the I.O. pins on the TTGo module, and that was it. I also added the uh, battery, and if we flip it over, you can see the battery inside there and that battery is connected to the battery connector on the TTGo module through this little slide switch over here so I can turn the power on and off. Now of course I've got the module mounted so it's sticking out over the edge and that allows me to get access to the battery underneath here. I also can see the built-in LED although it serves no real function in our remote control thing and here of course are the uh, USB connection I can use to both power and add data to it. So it's a pretty simple piece of construction and it's going to be great for controlling our Mechanum wheel robot. So now we've got all of our hardware built, both the robot car and the remote controller. It's time to focus now on the software, on the sketches that we're going to need to run in order to make everything work. But before I can show you the sketches for the robot car and for the controller, we're going to need one piece of information, and it's going to be a unique piece of information to the two ESP32 boards that you're using. And that is we need each board's MAC address. A MAC 
Mac or Media Access Control address is a unique address assigned to every network device on the planet, and your two ESP32 boards have these addresses. We're going to run a very quick script so that we can get the MAC address because we're going to need these. The controller is going to need the MAC address of the robot, and the robot's going to need the MAC address of the controller, and this is so the ESP Now protocol can set up a peer-to-peer -peer network between the two. So let's look at a quick sketch that we can run in order to get our MAC address, and then we'll move on to the sketches for both our robot car and for its controller. Here's the sketch that we're going to use to get our MAC address, and as you can see, this is a pretty simple sketch. I hardly even have to scroll over here. Uh, essentially, all that we do is we include the Wi-Fi library. We set up our serial monitor in the setup. We put our Wi-Fi into station mode, and then we print the MAC address. It's really as simple as that. So everything runs in the setup, and there is nothing in the loop. And what we'll get as a result is the MAC address itself. So I've already run this. So let's just go and take a look at it. Now I know the font is very small here. I apologize for that. But the MAC address is this address at the very beginning over here. And I've actually got this already done. So I've run it and put the MAC address for both of my ESP32s into a text file so that I can get at it very easy when I code because you're going to need to use this, of course, in the final code. And each unit's going to have to carry the other unit's MAC address. So this is the MAC address for my car ESP32. And this is the MAC address for the ESP32 that I'm using for the remote control. Control. And of course, if one day you decide to exchange your ESP32 for another one, you're going to have to do this again because the MAC address is unique to the ESP32. Now here's what we're trying to accomplish with the sketches for both the controller and the car. The controller and car will communicate with each other via ESP Now. The controller will be sending out data for the X and Y positions of the potentiometers inside the joystick. It'll also send out the switch state of the joystick, i.e. whether it has been pressed or not. The car will return data to the controller, and it will return the motor mode byte, that's the byte we've been working with to tell us which directions to turn the motors, the mechanum mode, there are several different modes we can put the car into, and it'll return back the mode it's currently in. It'll also return back data for all four of the PWM signals that it is sending to the motors. And this will be sent to the controller so it can be displayed on the display. So now let's go and take a look at those sketches. Now we'll begin by looking at the code that we're using for the robot car. And as you might imagine, the code has gotten to be quite long. In order to make it more understandable, and even more importantly, easier to modify for your own purposes, I've divided the code up into a number of different files other than the main INO file. This is a technique that you can use with the Arduino IDE, both the current one and the previous one. With the current IDE, you hit these three dots in the corner and go to the new tab. Give your file a name, and it will create a file with that name and an INO extension, and it will keep it in the same folder as your program file. The compiler knows this file is part of the program, and it will compile it for you. You can also force the order of compiling by alphabetically naming your files. So you'll notice that I've got these all alphabetically named, starting with an A, then a B, etc., etc. But this file here, of course, is always processed first because it's the main file. Now, I'm not going to go over every line of code with you. We already have a very long video, and it'll be twice as long if I did. But we've seen a lot of this code anyway, and there's a lot of repetition over here. First, I'll go over what all these different files are. This, of course, mech-robot-car.ino is the main file, and we'll go over that in some detail in a moment. The next file is the car functions file, and we've actually seen pretty well all of this before. These are the functions for both moving the motors and for setting the LEDs to the correct color, and so this is basically a repeat of what we've done before. The callback section is part of the ESP Now protocol. A callback is issued every time something is received or transmitted, and it creates two different functions, on data sent and on data received. And these functions are dealt with over here. As you can see, we don't do anything when we send data, but there is stuff we do when we receive it, and I'll go over that in a moment. 
The mechanum functions let you know what mechanum mode you're in. Our car uses a number of different modes. The standard mode is the one where you can go backwards, forwards, sideways, and at angles. And then we have different modes for all the different rotations and pivots. This is the section which selects which mode that we are going to be in. These final three files are the modes themselves. Mode 0 is the standard mode, and this is the longest one, and it's basically what we have seen before going diagonally or forward or backward or sideways. Mode 1 is the rotate mode, so it's just basically a smaller version of that previous file. And, mode, and the F file is modes 2 to 5, and these have all the different pivot modes inside them. But these functions are basically the same. They just call a different motor control byte, and they also move the, uh, the y-axis and the motors a little bit differently depending upon which mode you're in. So let's go back to the main file over here. Now we start off by including some libraries. The first three libraries you would be familiar with, of course, but this fourth library you might not be, and what this is is a watchdog timer library. I've implemented a watchdog timer on this. Now a watchdog timer is something that looks at your code, and if it sees the code isn't responding after a preset period of time, it'll perform an action. In my case, it'll restart the ESP32. I've done this so that at the cost happens to lose a signal or something goes wrong and it's still running, it'll turn itself off and reset. Now we start off the code by defining a timeout period, and that's in seconds. So I've got a three second watchdog timer. If it doesn't see a response within three seconds, it'll reboot. Now over here we've just defined all the motor connections as we've done before, the parameters uh, for the PWM as we've done before, the NeoPixels and the NeoPixel LEDs. These are the colors that we're going to be using for the NeoPixels. Again, we've seen all this stuff before. We create a NeoPixel bus object, which is how we work with this library. And this is also where we enter the MAC address of the other uh, responder, which in this case would be the remote control. Now remember, every ESP32 has its own MAC address, so this will be unique to mine. You will need to change this in your code. Now this is a very important part over here. Now this is the data structure for both the received and sent data, and this is how we communicate over ESP now. So in received data, we've defined a structure that has the x-axis, the y-axis, and the push-button switch, because that's the information that we are going to be getting from the controller. On the send one, the transmit one, these are the items we're going to send back to the controller to display on its display. The motor mode, uh, which lets you know which uh, eight bits that we have to control the motor. The mechanum mode, and this tells us which of these modes, the standard mode, the rotate mode, the pivot modes that we're currently in, and then the PWM speeds of the four different motors. And this will go back to the controller so we can display it on the display. And now that we've done all that, we create a timeout value for the ESP32. I've set it to 500 milliseconds. And this last receive time is just the marker that we set so that we can time that timeout value. These you've seen before, the different bytes that define the mechanum modes. And uh, here's the mechanum mode itself, where we put it into whether standard, rotate, pivot right, pivot left. These are the values that this mechanum mode will have for those different modes. Some variables for the motor speed, for the joystick values, and for the push button. And then we go into our setup. We've got a serial monitor set up just for troubleshooting. Of course, in normal operation, we don't use it. And we also remark out all the serial print commands because they're inefficient if we keep them in there. We set the ESP32 up as a Wi-Fi station, and we put it, we disable the Wi-Fi sleep. These are two requirements for ESP now. This one isn't necessarily a requirement, but if you don't do that, you can have intermittent issues. So I found this really helped a lot. Now we'll initialize the ESP now. We'll register both of those callback functions. So basically, as I said earlier, we have a callback function whenever we receive or send data. And those are the functions in the B section over here. We'll register our peer and add it. Then we go through the pin mode, set our connections up as outputs, the PWM frequency, we've seen that before. Here's where we enable the watchdog timer. And we enable it to that timeout, which we've set to three seconds, and true. And what true is, is it puts the watchdog timer into panic mode. And in panic mode, it'll just restart if it times out. 
and we're adding the current thread to the watchdog timer. You can monitor whatever we want, but if we add a null value here, it'll just monitor the current thread, which is exactly what we want. Now these commands are for our NeoPixels. It works a little bit differently than the Adafruit library, but it's pretty simple. We're going to begin and show, and that'll clear the whole display. We'll call a function called LED all stop, which is a function inside car functions. We'll go to that right now just to show you that. And there it is. And basically, this is how we work with these LEDs. We set the pixel color, and we'll tell it what LED and what color we're going to use, and then we do a show. And so this sets all of our pixels red. So it's pretty easy to see how to work with that new NeoPixel library. We stop all motors. That's a function in there again. We've seen that before. And we'll delay for a second. Now inside the loop, we'll check to see if we're still getting a signal. So we set a variable called now, which is the millis value. The millis value is the number of microseconds that the processor has been running for. Now we take a look to see if the last millis value and this one exceed the timeout. And if they do, the signal is lost. We'll stop the motors and we'll put everything into an error state. But if it isn't, we'll actually go through the loop. We'll set the LED status to the mechanum mode value. So that basically sets our status LED to tell us what mode we're in. We'll drive the car in this mode. We'll take the data that we're getting right now, the motor mode, mechanum mode value, etc., and we're going to assign it to these variables here. These are the variables that are part of our structured data. So this is what we're going to be sending back to the controller. And then we're going to send that back to the controller. We'll call this to reset the watchdog timer to let it know that we're still alive, put a short delay, and finish the loop. So that's really the main functionality. The car functions, as I said, you've seen these already. These are basically just to control the LEDs and to control the motors. The callbacks we'll take a look at. Now there is nothing that happens when we send data on this. When we send data, we just send it. This callback is issued, but it doesn't do anything. When we receive data, however, it's a bit different. First of all, we're going to check the length of the data. If it is a zero, we haven't received anything, there's some kind of a problem, so we'll stop everything, put everything in the, into an error mode, and set the joysticks and switch back to the default positions. However, if we have got data, then what we're going to do is pass that data on to our local variables over here. And you can see over here I've rammed out a number of serial prints that you can use when troubleshooting just to make certain you're getting data back from your controller. Now we're going to check this, the mechanum mode to see if that button's been pressed. And if it's true, we're going to toggle the mechanum mode to the next mode. So every time we press the joystick down, we'll change modes. And then we update our counter for the last receive time so that this variable at the beginning has something to work with. Now mechanum functions, as I said, just figures out what mode we're going to be in. So this is the toggle mechanum mode. And it'll toggle through all the different mode values. There are from 0 to 5. <clears throat> drive mechanum mode will tell us what mode value that we're in right now so we can go to the correct function to drive the motors and all those motors are all those functions excuse me for the motors are over here so we're just going to call motor control mode zero for example if the case is zero and we're going to pass it to there and for motor control zero we have to pass both the x and y axis but everything else just needs the y axis because for the rotate and pivot modes the x axis has no function so again it's a pretty complicated bit of code but when you divide it up like this it's not too hard to understand or modify so now let's go and take a look at the code that we're going to be using for our controller and now we'll look at the sketch for the remote control. And as with the sketch for the car, I've divided it up into a number of different files. We have the main files, remote functions, which really only has one function in it called convert joystick values. And that just simply converts our joystick values to the positive to negative 255 that we talked about earlier. The callbacks, of course, are the ESP now callback functions. Graphs are the two different graphs that we have on our display. Our display can have two different graphical displays. The first one, which I call graph motor speed, is a display of bar graphs. And it has four bar graphs, one representing each of the motors. The bar graphs will show you the speed of the motors, and they'll change color from blue to green depending on which direction the motor is going in. The background of the graph will be the color that indicates the uh, mechanic motor in, and that color will match the LED 
LED on the car. Now if we go down here, down, 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 we'll see the next one and that's display motor speed. Now with this display I have a little icon that's supposed to look like a car with four wheels. The wheels will change color depending on what direction they're traveling in and the speed of the wheel will be written beside the wheel. And the same deal with the background color, it will be changed to the same color as the LED that is on the car. Now this screens one only has one function in it called splash screen. The splash screen is displayed both at the very beginning when we boot up the remote control and if we have any error conditions. So we're going to send it both a message to display and an error state which we'll talk about in a moment and if the error state happens to be high and we're in error that will change the color of the splash screen to red. Now let's go and start with the first file. You're going to need to add a library for the TFT display. It's this library over here and you can get that in your library manager by typing in TFT underscore ESPI and install this TFT underscore ESPI by Bodmer into your Arduino IDE. Otherwise the libraries are all pretty standard. The SPI library of course is being used because the display internally is connected using the SPI bus. Now we define the inputs uh, for the joystick and also the um, connections for the internal push buttons on GPIO pin 35 and 0. Now there's an object we create uh, for our display over here for our display and sprites, sprites being the area that we're writing into on the display. These are the colors we're using on the display. Note that these aren't RGB but they are a different method of displaying colors. I talk a bit more about this in the article that accompanies this video in case you want to change these colors. The MAC address of the responder, in our case the responder is the car, and this is the area of code that you will definitely need to change for your operation to put in the MAC address of the ESP32 in your own car. The two data structures are the same as we did before in the car, except it's backwards. Our receive is the send that we had in the car, and our send is the receive. So we're going to receive data from the car. The motor mode, which is that byte that tells us which way the wheels are moving. Mechanum mode, which tells us whether we're in standard mode, rotate, or one of the pivot modes. And then the speed of the four different motors. And we can use that for our displays. And on our sent data, we're sending the X and Y axis values from the potentiometer converted from values uh, to negative 255 to positive 255. We're also sending the state of the push button switch so we know if it's been pressed. Now the ESP32, sorry, the ESP now stuff that we've seen before is all over here, the peer information, the byte for the motor mode. Here's a variable for the mechanum mode, uh, for the PWM speeds, for the joystick values, for the joystick push button. Now here's our connect error variable. We set it low normally, but if it goes high, we are in an error state. And connect status is a string that we are going to display on our splash screen. And we start off by saying we have no information. And this is the display select. Uh, byte and basically if it is at zero we're going to display the bar graph one we're going to display what I call the speed display which is a display that has a little car icon now here are two interrupt service routines, uh, one for each push button switch because pushing a switch is going to create an interrupt and all the switch needs to do is tell us which display we're selecting. So if we press the top switch, we're going to select that to a zero and display the display with the four bar graphs. If we select the bottom switch, we'll display the other display by setting display select to a one. Now we'll go into setup, serial monitor, pretty standard. We're going to set a uh, pin mode for the switch pin and the two built-ins, and we're going to use the input pull-ups. And so basically they'll always be held high until their respective switch has been pressed. Attach those interrupt handlers. Notice that we do it on falling so that when we go from high to low, we'll trigger the interrupt. And then the ESP32 setup as we did before, initialize it as we did before, only this time we're sending the status over to our uh, connect status and connect error. We're setting those, and so that can be used to display things on the screen. So if something does go wrong, we will get an ESP now error, and it'll be a red screen because connect error will be high. 
Register the callback functions. We've seen this before. Register the peers. This is all the ESP Now stuff we've seen before. We'll select the analog to digital resolution of 12 bits as opposed to the default 10 so we can get a bit more accuracy out of it. Here's where we initialize the TFT display and we'll set its rotation into landscape mode. We create a sprite and a sprite is an area on the display that we're going to be uh, working with and ours is the entire 320 by 170 display. And now we go and display the splash screen. So we'll call the splash screen function, the one that lives in the screens over here. We'll pass it our connect status and whether or not we're in an error mode. And that basically, whether we're in an error mode, we'll change the background color of that screen. We'll show that for two seconds and then we'll change connect status to waiting for car. We'll, and we'll display everything again. So that displays for two seconds as well. And over here is something you might find odd, but this is just to make the display not flicker when we first start up, we set our connect error to high. Now that actually isn't true, of course, generally, if the car is already on, that should be a low, but it doesn't matter. It's only gonna be one cycle of the loop and will prevent us from jumping into that screen and then jumping out of it when we find out the car isn't actually there. Now in the loop, we check that connection status. If it's low, it means everything's okay. So our display, we're going to select uh, which one. We'll take a look at the display select value and display either the graphic or the uh, car one accordingly. We'll get our joystick values and convert them with the convert joystick uh, values function that we looked at over here. And we're going to uh, finish that. Now the else over here is for this. So if the connect status was high where we have an error, remember when we come in off of setup, we're going to have an error. We're just going to set our splash screen up with the connect status. We'll set it high so that it's red because the connect status will basically say that the car hasn't been found yet. And we'll set these joystick axes to their standard default values of in the middle. Now after that in the loop for both of them, we'll go and check the uh, status of the switch. And so basically this is the joystick switch. If it has been pressed, then we'll set the state to true. If it hasn't been pressed, we'll set it to false. Now here we format the data that we're going to send out to the car. So this is our structured data here, and we'll send it to the car here. And then at the very end of the loop, we add a short delay. The period of the delay depends on whether or not the joystick has been pressed. If it hasn't been pressed, we're gonna delay for 50 milliseconds. But if it has, we're gonna delay for 200, and that's a form of deep bouncing it. Now, as I said, remote function simply has a convert joystick values. And in convert joystick values, you're going to see two different values. Remember, we're going from 0 to 4095 because we have a 12-bit converter. 2200 and 1800, these are the thresholds for a zero. So anything between 1800 and 2200 is going to be considered a zero. And this is because joysticks aren't exactly perfect, so we can't expect it in the middle to be at the actual value that we want. Now you can, of course, if you want, change those values. You can make this 1800 higher and the 2200 low, lower to reduce that range and maybe get a bit more movement out of your joystick. I found these values worked for me but you can play with them yourself. Now let's look at the callbacks. In this case, we actually have one when we send the data. We didn't in the car, but we do here. We take a look to see the status to see if it was a successful send. And if the status is successful, great. We'll keep connection error at low. And the connect status is car found, but chances are we're not even displaying that screen at, the po at this point anyway. However, if we don't get anything that says that this connect status was successful, then we'll print car not found and set connect error to high. So in the loop, when we go and check that, we're going to run the, uh, the section of the loop, which brings up the splash screen, displays car not found, and passes the connect error of high, which will turn our splash screen red. Now here's the callback function that's executed when the data has been received and there's not really much to do. We basically just get the data and pass it to a number of different local variables over here. Now these are the functions for the two different graphs. As I said, we have display motor speed and at the top over here we've got the graph the motor speed. Now this basically just goes through. We'll set the background color uh, 
depending on to what uh, the operation mode is and so that color is going to match the color of the status LED on the car and then we're going to fill the sprites uh, with a couple of rectangles this basically draws our screen we'll draw the text through the screen this routine over here and this is actually some code I got from Volo's project it's quite easy to do and I just modified a, a bit this this displays the labels on the left sidebar and it's a uh, it's an easy way of doing it you could also do it discreetly if you want here's a text for the bottom in this case is the bar graph so we're doing RF LF RR and LR to indicate our different motors and uh, the bar graph values we're going to get over here and we're going to map those results and then we're going to set the bar graph colors by the motor direction and so we'll get the motor direction and we'll also fill the rectangles according to the bar graph value and so that actually moves the bar graph up and down so that's pretty cool and we do that for all four of them over here at the very end when you finish these commands it's important to do this you have to do a sprite push sprite and push it to the corner because we're going to do the whole display and we're going to paint the display display motor speed does a similar thing again we set the background colors over here we set up a couple of uh, of different rectangles and that just to basically look like a car we'll we'll get the motor speed values again we'll set the wheel colors by motor direction this is similar to what we did with the bar graphs except we also now have a red color and uh if it's red we'll also set this value to say off it could say zero but i thought off looked better if you'd rather have zeros you could just eliminate these from the four different ones we have for right front left front right rear and left rear and then at the end of that we'll display the speed values we'll draw a string right beside all of the wheels and we paint the display now screens over here just basically uh is the splash screen and the splash screen will get the message at an error state and basically if the error state is high we are going to make everything display color six which is going to turn it all red and uh we'll basically just set some text on it and over here it's the same thing except display color 2b which is green and we set some text on the display and at the very end whatever we've done we push it over to the display and so that's basically the code for our remote control again you can go and modify it you could add more functions more screens etc if you wanted to but i'd suggest you start off with it this way so now let's load everything up and see if everything works and so everything's been built, the wiring's been checked, the code has been uploaded to the ESP32s on both the car and the controller. All that remains right now is to turn everything on and give our robot car a test drive. Okay, I'm ready to test the car. I've got it on the workbench. It's up on blocks at the moment. I've got both the remote and the car turned off. I'm going to turn the remote on first. And you see it goes through its splash screen waits for the car and then says the car isn't found which of course makes sense because the car isn't on at the moment so let's turn the car on and the car boots up its top light is light blue which is also the same as the background on the remote right now and we're in standard mechano mode and we're in the graph mode so if I move it up we'll go forward if I move it here we'll go backward we can go sideways and to the other side and you'll notice that the lights on both the car and the display colors on the graph match each other now i can put the display into the other mode and we can watch it over there and we can see the various speeds of the wheels i'll go sideways go and see that we can also change modes so over here i'm now in rotate mode and you'll note that the car's led on the top also changed to the same green so in rotate mode they go in opposite directions as indicated here We'll flip through some of the pivot modes here's the front pivot mode for example and if we change the graph mode here you can see only two of the motors are driven in front pivot mode here's the pivot rear mode and we're back to the standard mode again now if i turn off the remote the car status lights goes red and the other leds are violet and that indicates i've got no connection and if i connect the remote back up we are back in business 
So it looks like the car is working and the next test of course would be to put it down the ground and drive it around. Okay, I've got the car on the floor. I'm going to put it through some of its basic moves. So we'll just go forward. Now we don't have a lot of area, so we'll have to do it slowly. And reverse. Let's do a sideways movement. The other side. And we'll bring it back. Let's put it into another mode. Now we're in rotate mode. We're going to rotate the other direction as well. Now here's the right pivot. Let's do a left pivot. The front pivot. And of course the rear pivot. So we'll put it back in the standard mode. Maybe rotate it a bit. Back all the way to standard again. And it looks like the car can go through all the basic motions. And of course, if I had more space, I could really have a lot of fun with it. But as you can see, we seem to have a working Mechanum robot car. So as you can see, a Mechanum Wheel robot is both a fun project to play with and an educational one to build. And I do hope that you take the time to put one of these together. Now, this is the end of the video, but it is certainly by no means the end of this robot project. I've already left space, as I've shown you, for speed sensors on it. And there is some space on the front of the chassis that's just dying for more electronics or maybe even a single board computer. So I'm sure you'll be seeing this robot again here in the DroneBot Works. Shop. Now, if you want to build the robot that I built today, or if you want to build something similar to it, you'll find the information that you need, plus all of the code that you need, in the article that accompanies this video on the DroneBotWorkshop.com website. And there's a link to that right below the video. Now, while you're on the website, if you haven't yet, please consider signing up for my newsletter. It's not a sales letter. It's just my way of keeping in touch with you to let you know what's going on here in the workshop. And if you want to discuss this project, a great place to do that is on the DroneBot Workshop forums. You'll find a dedicated thread to this video. There's one for every one of my videos. Plus, you can discuss general topics with a bunch of like-minded individuals who are happy to answer your questions, and you might even be able to answer a few of theirs. So it's free to sign up for the forum as well. And finally, while you're in a signing up mood, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. I make videos about electronics and microcontrollers and about little mechanics wheel robots and it's really easy to subscribe just hit that red subscribe button and also click on that bell notification and assuming that you've enabled notifications on your YouTube you'll get notified every time that I make a new video so until the next time please take care of yourself stay safe out there enjoy your Mechanum wheel robot and I'll see you again very soon here in the DroneBot workshop goodbye for now